I appreciate that. I appreciate that. All right, let's see. So this should, this is recording. Let me share my screen with you and then we're going to get going, okay? Uh, sorry, yesterday on the whole presenting thing. Sometimes this takes a while, but we're just going to roll with it. If anything, Gage can turn his camera on and live stream class. I got you. We need to do it. We'll do it. All right, so today we're doing something a little bit different. We've been talking about major battles of the past, you know, for the past several days. Uh, we'll talk We'll talk about Gallipoli. Uh, I know we didn't quite finish that. We'll talk a little bit about Gallipoli today. But on, what's going on? What's going on? My phone's ringing. Uh-oh. It's ringing in my ear. Look at these AirPods. All right. Yeah, it work. That's what you do. Doesn't know. Text me. People don't leave voicemails, People Greg. Leave voicemails. Voicemail See, is not, dead. I get a lot of voicemail, not a lot, but I get some voicemails. And you listen to them? Yeah. You know what I do with them? Yeah. Click, delete. If you want me, text me. I have like 300 or some voicemails. And the box is full. Why don't you check them? Right. <laughs> delete. <laughs> delete. All right, so our bell ringer for today. This goes back to what we were talking about yesterday with the first battle of E, and also uh, the battle of Gallipoli or the Gallipoli campaign, which we'll talk about a little bit more here in just a few minutes. Um, I guess I guess we probably should go over that first. Um, we'll kind of quickly go through that. We talked about it some yesterday. We'll quickly go through that, and then we'll we'll get to our big topic for today. All right. So what I asked you guys, or what we talked about yesterday. Was controlling waterways. So I asked you in your bell ring today, why were controlling the waterways and ports important to both the Allied and Central Powers? Who in class can, can tell us a good answer to this? Who's got it? Who's got it? Who's got it? Will, yes, sir. You can um, get supplies easier faster. No, you can get supplies faster. How are they moving supplies? There's really only two ways they're moving supplies. One, one is by railway, by railroad, by train. The other is by ship. You ever wonder why it's called shipping? Oh. <laughs> yeah, because that's that's how most products are, are. That's how most like that's how a lot of products were moved, right? Because there was only really two ways for mass transportation. And that that's with any type of supply, any type of you know items you need, and also people. Also, people. That's the other part of that. How are you transporting soldiers? There's really three ways soldiers are being transported. One, by railway. Two, by ship. Three, by taxi. Yeah. yeah. You know that, Greg? You know that? Seems like, a, seems like an awkward way to go. Yeah, so the first battle of the Marne, they actually took taxis to the front lines. Yeah. Huh? Like a car. Like a car. Like car. How many different things fit in a car? They can only fit like two. So what's the point? <laughs> well, they need to get to the front lines as quick as possible. So these taxis, they would they turn their meter on, and they're just running soldiers back and forth to the front line. They probably made their whole life savings that day. They should strike straight into the other Yeah, but they need to get them there quickly. Automobile was... The thing was about that, too... Was that the automobile was still pretty early on, like in its you know infancy, and so most of the soldiers had never been in a car before. That was their first time being in a car, and it happened to be going to the front lines the first battle of Mars. So I didn't make it. All right. It wasn't fast at all. Look it up. I'm I am interested to find that out. All right, if you're, if you're the mob, we need we need a, we need a stat guy. Who's gonna be the stat guy? That looks up stuff. Blake. So you gotta look up stuff. When we have questions, we're asking you. So we got a little system going now. We got a little system going. A little system going. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna briefly just kind of wrap up the Battle of Gallipoli, which we talked about a little bit yesterday. Then we're gonna look at the sinking of the Lusitania. 2025. Did you say 20? Hey, great. All right, never mind. Blake, you're done. You don't have to. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, whoops, I'm on the wrong thing. All right, so real quick, we'll just go through the last of the Battle of Gallipoli. Um, so let's unfreeze this. This will take literally like five minutes because we talked about about half of it yesterday. Uh, we got right to the end of class because I'm not good at managing my time sometimes. I forget that we have very short classes. Hey, makes you hey, like an hour class. Do you like that? You like having like one hour classes? Yeah. Would you rather be longer? No. no okay. <laughs> okay. I figured that was going to be the answer. I just had to ask. I had to ask. All right. So, Battle of Gallipoli, we looked at this yesterday. Um, again, this is part of your battle chart. Your battle chart, I may do originally on Friday. I'm going to back that up just uh, probably to the end of the week, till Monday, uh, just so we have a little bit more time. And they're calling for snow tomorrow. So, uh, yeah. Uh, um, they are calling for snow, but ain't going to happen. Okay. Um. Real quick, real quick, we'll run through this real quick, real quick, real quick. If we can get this pulled up. Hmm. Internet is slow, though. Get in line. This is where I need, like, uh, uh, I need to work on my stand up. That's all you care about, isn't it? No, That's all you care asking. about. First day at school, and all you care about is when you get out. Jacked up, man. 1250. See. 1250. 1250, and then your last class starts at one, ends at two. And you're done. All right, all right. Come on, come on. Get this pull up. Please pull up. All right, anyways. So, yesterday, we were talking about the race to the sea. We were talking about the race to the North Sea that is going on between Germany and France and Britain. And we're also talking about the race to uh, the, let's see, the Black Sea and the Aegean Sea. Between again the the Ottoman Empire, Austria Hungary, who are both in on the uh, also part of the Central Powers with Germany, um, <clears throat> because again controlling the waterways is important. Because if you control the waterways, you control what supplies get in, uh, who supplies get in, what soldiers get. In. You control you control a lot of uh, the transportation within. Come on now, let's go. This is so slow. This is so ridiculously slow. Huh? It's fine? Yeah. No, it's not. We got stuff we need to get done, dude. We're talking about the Lusitania today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh. Greg, what are we going to do, man? Don't you don't you miss the good old days? Yeah. Everything went so smoothly. Everything went so smoothly. Now it's all just jacked up. Okay, here we go. So we'll cut this off real quick. This is what we were talking about in class yesterday. For those of you that were not here, we're talking about, again, how they're trying to control, we say they, the central powers uh, and the allied powers, are trying to control this waterway. Over here is Russia. Russia is cut off from Europe. That is essentially what the Gallipoli campaign, the Battle of Gallipoli, is about. Uh, it's, it is a large series of battles that take place on this peninsula right here near bulgaria uh and again like right at the edge of turkey okay turkey is part of the ottoman empire uh again the goal here is for the allied powers to take control of the waterways so if they control this that means russia has access to europe if the central powers control that then russia does not have these, this, uh, you know, again, this water passage, these waterways in and to, uh, in and from Europe, excuse me. So we're talking about the Black Sea and the Aegean Sea. All right, so the casualties here, um, again, we're talking about some countries we really haven't talked about too much yet. The Ottoman Empire, they have about 250,000 casualties, while the Allied powers, which in this case consists of France, I put France in there twice, I don't know why, France, Britain, New Zealand, Canada, and Australia, oh. India. India should be in there. Yeah, I saw some friends here twice. Um, anybody remember why we said there were so many, like, what? Well, hold on. Let's, 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 let's do this. Let's do this. Let's cross this out. So forget that. Yesterday, I asked you guys, why? Take away this. Why? What do these countries have in common right here? If you guys are listening. 
What do these countries have in common? British colonies. Boom! British colonies. British colonies. Because France is under British colonies. Because France is under British colonies. <laughs> okay, you're right. Yeah, I can't do nothing about that. Yeah, so all of these are British colonies, uh, except for France, obviously, because France is its own country. All right, so I just want to make sure that we're listening. Um, the victor and importance of the Gallipoli campaign. Let me erase this real quick. This was a decisive Ottoman victory. Again, the Ottoman Empire we're talking about, like modern day Turkey, uh, in the lower parts of Asia. This is part of the southern race to the sea, again, to control the Black and the Aegean Sea. Uh, the goal of the Central Powers is to keep Russia disconnected from the rest of Europe, and they succeeded. Um, they succeeded so much, or so well, in controlling that area that uh, the Allied powers had to question what Europe was going to look like going forward. They had to begin questioning if Europe was going to be controlled by the Central Powers after you know World War One came to a conclusion, so at the beginning of you know we've talked so far about several battles that Germany well they are the decisive victor. We talk about the uh, the first large large long battle of World War One, the Battle of Gallipoli, the Gallipoli campaign it takes place over eleven months, and we see the Ottomans, the Ottomans, another central power are victorious. This is not going well for the Allied powers early in World War I. But also, I'll tell you this, it's about to get even worse for the Allied powers for two reasons. All right, so let's take a look at what we are going to discuss today. Yo, which question? Huh? Because we didn't finish that. Who asked that? Devin. Devin asked that? We didn't finish it. I thought I don't know. Well, tell him because we didn't finish it. Okay, well, make sure he knows because we didn't finish it. Make sure Devin knows. Make sure Devin knows. All right, stick in the Lusitania. All right, so you do, need to write, you do need to. This is going to be something that you are going to have to write, okay? These are actual notes. I know, man. you got to do some stuff. I know, I know. I hate to ruin you, Devin. This is something I do want you to write. This is something I do want you to write because this is an event that is not in our battle chart. The battle charts and the slideshows I put together are to help you, to give you a resource. I don't have to go through them as much as I have, but I just like you, I just want you guys to understand what's going on. Um, maybe sometimes I take a little longer than I need to. I just want you guys to understand kind of how and what's happening in World War One. Because if we, the more we understand about World War One and the movement of World War One, the struggles in World War One, much better we understand World War Two. Yes. What about did what? We about left. I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted. All right. So today, title of our notes right here, the event we are discussing. This will bother me. Uh, the sinking of the Lusitania. Greg, what is the Lusitania? The uh, wind the Yeah, it's like yeah, very much so. Very much so. It's a large, very large passenger ship, cruise line. Okay. Anybody ever been on a cruise before? You have? Where'd you go? Jamaica. Okay. You have fun? Yeah. Never been on a cruise. Fine one, too. Never been on one. Heard they're fun. My parents have been on one. Like a, I don't know. I've always got never been. I've always got out of the country. I've never been out of the country. You go to Spain? Huh? Oh. Ah, dude, look, if I'm going to another country, well, that'd be a lot cheaper. Huh? Well, it's like five. Yeah, but if I go as a chaperone, it's a lot cheaper. But then I gotta watch y'all. Are you go? Then I gotta know any Spanish to go. Uh, you got no Spanish to go to Spain? We're doing Spanish school. Oh. Yeah. 
Maybe you do. I don't know. Don't listen to me. All right, so the sinking of the Lusitania. Again, is a large, very large cruise liner ship. Okay, so why are we discussing the sinking of it today? Why? What does that have to do anything with World War One? Well, uh, depending on who you talk to, depending on who you talk to, and I mean this both today and back then, the sinking of the Lusitania is going to be one of the big reasons that the United States is going to get involved with World War One and the rest of Europe. Because right now we haven't talked about America too much, even though some of their allies are in uh, and involved in World War I. Can you name two of the allies of the United States? Britain. Britain? Who's the other? France. France. Good, good. They are two. They're, they're, they are America's, they're the United States' biggest allies, especially mil militarily. Okay. I'm not hating so the sinking of the Lusitania. So we're going to talk about that today. So first, first, what was the Lusitania? Again, British luxury cruise ship. So hold on, Mr. Trivey. You're telling me that the United States, one of the reasons they're going to get involved in World War I is because a British ship was sunk? A British ship was sunk? Yep, that's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. But Mr. Trivey, that doesn't make sense. Why doesn't that make sense? Because it's a British ship. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, hold on. I'll tell you in a minute why America has so much invested in this ship. So, in 1907, it was the largest ship in the world. Greg, what year did the Titanic sink? I can't remember. Dang it, Greg. Blake? 1912? Boom. Perfect. 1912. Titanic was built after Lusitania. It was based upon the Lusitania, uh, but was built, you know, again, like you said a minute ago, Greg, it was kind of like the twin ship of the Titanic, Lusitania was. Um, the Lusitania mainly traveled between Britain and the United States. Man, that'd be a cool cruise. I think that'd be awesome. I don't know if y'all be into that, but I would, man. Freaking going the opposite way across the Atlantic. You know, a lot of them came this way. I want to go back the other way, see what it's like. Across the Atlantic, going to going to Britain, going to Spain. Y'all taking a ship? Y'all take a ship? I'm not going to a boat. What are you? Y'all take a plane? I don't understand. You don't know? When y'all leaving? I might get in the boat. Why? Because. I'm scared. Ocean, Ocean is scared. You ain't lying, dude. Ocean is scared. It's not the scariest thing on the world in the world. It's water. Really? I love I love getting in the ocean, man. I like getting in there, like right at my neck, and just dude, just sitting in there for like three hours. Dude, that's just like. The psychopath? Yeah. You're yeah. yeah. Dude, I love being in the ocean. Huh? Don't have them the way I go to the beach. What's this about? Yeah, don't hate on the way I, I like to beach it. I like to be out there and just be in the water. I love it. I love it. Absolutely love it. But you look out at the water, you look out, you know, on the ocean, and you just you you lose sight, right? You lose sight. You really do. Because it's just all like if you just look at the ocean, it's all the same thing. You ever been like bit or stone by I stepped on a fish one time, that scared me. Have you ever been stung by a jellyfish? I got stung on last year. How'd it feel? Did it hurt? Yeah, hit me on the leg like this nickel Really? My brother got stung by one. He, he's like, oh, jellyfish! That was pretty funny. I've never been stung. I found one. I picked it up. What'd you do with it? What was it Well, it, it started flopping, so I threw it. Okay. Now, I've never been stung. I've never been bit by anything. Much of that remains. Atlantic, if you look, you got the Atlantic Ocean. I should say Atlantic Ocean, because that's not. You got the Myrtle Beach. You can't tell if something's coming to you. You don't ask your time. Other banks is pretty clear. Like, not crystal clear water, but it's pretty clear. Myrtle Beach. You stepped on the sand room? Oh my god, that's that. Made that a lot. That's good. Uh, you know, the, anybody, like, so, anybody ever been to the Gulf Coast? What's that? To the Gulf Coast. Oh, what's in there? Yeah, well, I got Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, right here. Like, if you can see my map, I know that's small, but like, right here, that's the Gulf Coast. Can you see that? Yeah, you can see that? Yeah, it's Gulf Coast. 
Right, like right there. It's actually like pretty clear. What? Yeah, like that side of Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's pretty clear there. Like the water is pretty clear. I think the reason the reason it's so like it's not necessarily dirty, but the reason it's like so clouded, like along our coastline, is uh, I think it's due to the. That's what I've heard. It's due to the. Uh, it's the word of the, the thing. Lord. Huh? The thing. Yeah, you, you know the. the under the earth. Okay, I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, the Lusitania uh, ship was 787 feet long and carried over 3,000 passengers. Man, that thing was like a beauty. Not while it's on fire, but. Thanks, Sub. Thanks, Sub. You can in there. You can probably fit like 8,000 people if you really wanted to. I mean, yeah, maybe. But I mean, you could say that about a lot of things. Like, how many people can you fit in a car? Well, I mean, standard, it's about four, but you can fit more than that if you really had to. All right, so the lead up, the lead up to the event of the sinking of the Lusitania. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about all the good times the Lusitania had. We're talking about the bad We're talking about the time that it got hit and it sunk. Oh, Patrick something said he went to the Okay. Why? Well, well, there's not many waves there either. Not many waves. I wouldn't know. I'm telling you, there's not many waves there. Well, I've been twice. I can't say this. Uh, yes, yeah, so I can't say it like I know it for a fact. But the both times I went, the water is is a little bit more clear than it is, like you know, Myrtle Beach, Wilmington area, and also there's a lot. There seem to be a lot less waves. I don't know if that happened to be you know just at that particular moment, or if there's just less waves there to begin with. Um, I don't know. Water is a little warmer as well, but I do know that's the fact because when it's a little bit further south, also it's uh you know it's kind of corralled like the Gulf. Mexico you know has kind of boundaries, a little bit more than just wide open Atlantic Ocean. All right, so when World War One began in 1914, the German Navy had been attempting to cut off British and French trade routes. Mm, man. We were talking earlier about waterways and why they're important for trade also. We talked about supplies, but it's not just supplying your troops. It's also just like the regular trade that you have to do anyway. Again, that's how economies work. There's, there is not one economy in the world, at least like, I mean, there's probably, there's probably small, really small civilizations that are self-sufficient, but Amish. But if you're talking about countries, no country is completely self-sufficient. We all trade with each other. That's what keeps us essentially a large part of, and we'll tell you this, large part of the economy, large part of trade is to establish like diplomatic relations so you don't go to war with each other. Because you know who doesn't go to war with each other? Countries that trade with each other. So anyway, uh, Britain and France, uh, are try they are getting their trade routes cut into by the German Navy. Uh, in 1915, the Germans began using what are called U-boats. These U-boats are, you know, again, like what we think of as submarines. And on the 4th of February of that year, of 1915, the Germans declared that any Allied ship that entered that region, we'll talk about what region we're talking about, but entered the region that Germany was controlled, any ship that entered that region would be fired upon. Okay, so... We need to ask a couple questions, okay? So just but so Germany, just because they control a region, does that give them to right the right to fire on any ship that comes in that region? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is up for discussion. This is up for discussion, especially in wartime, because here's the problem. Again, they are at war. Britain and France are part of the Allied powers. If Germany can cut off their trade routes, that means Germany can keep Britain and France for continue to be ready supply. We see this in war all the time, like cut out the trade routes. It's called a siege a lot of the times, where you just you take a you know you take a, a like maybe in World War II this happens and it's, it's phenomenal. But what happens is like you know say one group takes control of a city and then you just surround them, you just bleed them out, you just cut off all their supplies. And then just over time, you just wear them down. Yes, yeah. Well, 
Um, good question. You know who they don't punish? The country that wins. Well, if it's the whoever, like these things about like rules of war, they, there are rules of war, but if you win the war, they're they're really not enforced. So how do you enforce them? So there's going to be rules of war, and all the ones that Germany breaks during World War One are going to be enforced upon them by the winning countries. But how is it enforced? How is it enforced? Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll talk about this with the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, a lot of it comes down to like economic pressure, uh, ec like, like economic pressure, and then like government oversight. So like you, you've heard of the United Nations before, right? You, yes or no? Yeah. Okay. All right. United Nations is like a bunch of countries in the world. They get together and they make decisions together. Okay. So it's like their attempt to like try to have like you know world peace. If like today there's a war that breaks out and between I don't know uh, pick good countries China China and the US. Africa. All right, all right. Africa's a time. Oh, China though. You go with China. You did really good with China. All right, so yeah, if there's a if there's a war to break out between the U.S. and China and America wins, okay, so all the countries from the United Nations. Again, America being one of those, they're, they're going to be responsible for enforcing those sanctions. A lot of times this comes down to like economic pressure. It may even come down to government oversight. After World War I and after World War II, uh, after both of them, the League of Nations, which was the precursor to the United Nations, is going to kind of have a hand in the government of Germany. Okay, so the only way that these are really enforced is if the countries that win choose to enforce them. In World War II, th this is the reason we have to understand World War I before we get to World War II is because the reason that Germany and Nazi Germany and World War II begins at all is because the punishments from the Treaty of Versailles were incredibly strict, incredibly uh, evasive, invasive. And they could not be enforced over the long run because they were so strict and because they were so harsh. So Britain and France, the countries that are supposed to be enforcing these, you know, these sanctions, stopped doing it. And when they stopped doing it, the rise of Hitler and Nazi Germany comes full force. And then not, not long after that, Britain and France are going to be fighting a completely new war because they came up with way too harsh and strict punishments. They could be acted out for a long amount of time. And now you've got Germany that's had 20 years to speak this long. Now they're going to be got back for revenge. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> Germany wants to cut off supplies. They will cut off trade. All right. So let's look at the departing of the Lusitania. Because, again, this is a cruise ship. It's not got supplies on it. Why would you do that? No, this is a cruise ship. I'll tell you some theories in a little bit. But, but so this cruise ship, the Lusitania, set sail on May 1st, 1915. From New York City. Anybody been to New York City before? How'd you like it? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Big, big city. A lot of people. So they leave from New York City. Again, we talked about this in class too. The biggest, like most of the biggest cities in America, really around the world, are near water. New York City is right near the water. Right near the water. Same with Philadelphia. Same with Boston. Same with Washington, D.C. Same with Baltimore. Uh, Charleston. Uh, Miami. Name some other big city. But you'll find them pretty close to the water. Not all of them. Like Phoenix ain't close to the water. This is a big city. There are exceptions, but most of your big cities are near one. So they leave from New York City on May 1st, 1915, towards Liverpool, England. There are over 1,900 passengers, and 159 of them are American. Okay? There are about 160 passengers that are American. The rest of them, um, mainly British, but there are you know, some, you know, some uh, 
different uh, countries of origin on there as well. Now, <clears throat> the German, again, controlling the North Sea, or attempting to control some of the North Sea, and, um, oh, you're getting that other one right now. So, uh, uh, but anyways, they warned the Lusitania that it would be sunk if it entered British waters. Again, you have German U-boats near Britain that are attempting to cut off their trade. You have German U-boats that are sitting outside Britain waiting to cut off their trade. And they said they will fire on any ship, on any ship that enters British waters. Now, again, Here's the thing. Lusitania is not just any ship. This isn't a ship that is coming to resupply the Allied troops or even to trade with any of the Allied powers. And that is where things get a little bit interesting. So because this is a passenger ship, this is a cruise liner ship, the British and the U.S., their intelligence departments, don't take this very serious. They look at, they look at, you know, Germany giving this these uh, these threats as being empty threats. They believe that Germany is bluffing. There's no way they're going to fire on a passenger ship. This isn't carrying supplies. It's carrying weaponry. It's not carrying uh, soldiers. They're not going to fire on a passenger ship. Everything's going to be okay. Not only was it not not you know carrying supplies, but also not part of you know the navy. Either. It wasn't a part of the American Navy. It wasn't a part of the British Navy. So the Germans didn't have anything to worry about. They were just, they were just trying to scare the British and the Americans. They were just trying to scare them. That's what the intelligence from each country thought. But, um, well, I guess you can go ahead and kind of start guessing that uh, well, the British and United States intelligence agencies, uh, they were mistaken. All right, so the sinking of the Lusitania, May 7th, so six days later, German U-boats fire on the Lusitania as it enters British waters. What, I'll, I'll say about 1,200 of those 1,959 passengers die as a result of the German U-boats firing on the Lusitania. Again, six days, six days pass. And the Lusitania. You got to think about if if you are, you know, British or U.S. intelligence. Those six days, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of anxiety going on right there. It's like, okay, look, they made this threat. So they can't be serious, right? And it's like on May first, okay, yeah, yeah, they, they can't be serious. May second comes, okay, uh, yeah, then they're not serious. Everything's gonna be fine. May third comes. All right, we need to start thinking about this. Could that be serious? May 4th. All right. Ooh. Man. In a couple days. I hope uh, I hope nothing, nothing happens here. I hope we were right. May 5th. May 6th. May 7th. You know that there had to be intelligence officers that are thinking, intelligence analysts that are worried that maybe, maybe Germany was bluffing. And on May 7th, Germany showed they were not looking. This was not an empty threat. That Germany was going to fire on any ship that entered British waters because, again, like we talked about earlier, Gage, you asked a great question about how are the rules of war enforced. They are enforced by the countries that win the war. They are enforced by the countries that win the war. The countries that win the war don't have law rules or uh, you know sanctions placed upon them. They can. They can, but usually they are much more lenient if they are. If, if there are sanctions placed on you know, the victorious country, if you want to call it that. The sanctions they do receive are very lenient. This leads to something that we know as total war. War without rules. And maybe that's, maybe that's what war actually is. These rules, these guidelines, these parameters to war... They're really just kind of suggestions because once, once it hits a peak, once it hits a point, those rules go out the window. There are no laws to war when it's kill or be killed. It's simply a decision to survive. 
And the Germans know that if they lose this war, even this early in 1915, they know if they lose this war, they are going to be not only severely punished, but Europe is going to change and their country is going to change. All right. They have to win this. Maybe the it's crazy to think if Germany would have won World War I, would World War II have happened? Maybe, maybe it just happened in a different manner. It's tough to say. So the killing of this many passengers, again, you're seeing a large number. I don't know the ratio to that. Give us a percentage. Stat man. Stat man. Need a percentage. 1198 divided by 1959. It's the stat man right there. Just divide these up. We want a percentage. 61% of the passengers are killed. 61% of the passengers on this ship, on the Lusitania, are killed. And the killing of this many passengers enraged the British and the U.S. Now, a large, large, a large part of this um, rage, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, a large part of this rage comes from the citizens, not from the government especially in the United States. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. A large part of the rage doesn't come from the government in the U.S. It comes from the citizens. Uh, Germany, again, claimed that the sinking was justified since cargo and ammunition, uh, cargo such as ammunition and shell cases, were found amongst the debris. So, while, again, the Lusitania was carrying this was a passenger ship, and it was carrying a lot of, um, you know, a lot of just civilians. There were, you know, there was ammunition found among the wreckage. There were shell cases found among the wreckage. But Germany could know that until after the fact. Either. So again, they justify it in retrospect, and the British and the U.S. are. Yeah, again, claiming that Germany could not have known this, could not have known this, that they should not have fired on the ship, even though it did. Again, we're not talking about we're not talking about to resupply, you know, entire, you know, entire fields in France with ammo. We are talking about ammunition and shell casings that could be used against the Germans. Well, you can look at it that way too. Look at that. It kind of goes both ways, but. Either way, this is going to play a large part in the remainder of World War I because of this. U.S. citizens and British citizens. But Britain's already in World War I. The United States is not. The rage felt by the normal everyday citizens is going to have a large effect. Okay? Okay? Let's see. Right. We done with that? Yeah. Okay. So you guys do have an assignment to go with this. We're going to look at it real quick. I'm going to let you do it on your own. Uh, it's not long. It's just a couple questions, a little bit of reading. Um, but we need to understand exactly, okay, so if the government wasn't outraged, well, why is that? What do you mean the government wasn't outraged? Huh? It was the citizens that kind of are the ones that make the sinking of the Lusitania. It's kind of like rallying call. So let's go ahead and take a look at the instructions. Several of you already got turned in. Great, 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 great. All right. So, uh, read, read the following introduction excerpt from Theodore Roosevelt. Answer the questions attached. Okay. So, let's open this. Let's open. Actually, I already got this open over here. I'm not going to open another tab of the same thing. How do I make feel? Good? All right. <clears throat> so, uh, let's see. I am. Let's scroll up a little bit. So this is just one page. All right. So what you see in bold right here is uh, is an introduction. Okay, it's an introduction. So on uh, May seventh, nineteen fifteen, the British passenger ship Lusitania sunk in New York and Liverpool was torpedoed by a German U-boat. It was changed to sink, killing one hundred fifty, uh, eleven hundred ninety-five people on board, including one hundred twenty-three Americans. I know the stats. A little bit different here versus our 
uh, or notes. I will tell you this. There are differing counts here. There are differing counts as to how many people uh, boarded to begin with. Because while, while there was, you know, those, that information was taken, uh, it also was not near as accurate. We didn't take statistics the same way, not even then, um, in terms of like passports and everything like that. So the numbers are similar. They may not be the same. That just depends on the source, really. Um, which, go, which that's another interesting conversation to have you know, another, you know, at another time. How numbers from 200 years ago, numbers for today, um, are different depending on the source in which you get. Anyway, uh, the incident created sharp reactions among Americans, many of whom believe the United States should inflict an immediate reprisal upon Germany. President Woodrow Wilson, however, took a cautious approach to responding to the, to the attack, demanding from Germany an apology, compensation for American victims, and a pledge to discontinue unannounced suffering warfare. You may already see, you may already see an issue with Woodrow Wilson's comments. Uh, let me uh, fix that spelling error right there. That's going to bug me. All right. Former President Theodore Roosevelt disagreed with Wilson's diplomatic response to the sinking of the Lusitania. Roosevelt believed that the attack warranted a military reprisal and that the United States had little choice but to enter the war. In June 1915, Roosevelt wrote to an acquaintance criticizing Wilson's handling of the incident, writing, if Lincoln, who are we talking about here? If Lincoln, what Lincoln? Abraham Lincoln? President Lincoln? If Lincoln had acted after the firing of Sumter in the way that Wilson did about the sinking of the Lusitania, in one month, the North would have been saying they were so glad he kept them out of war. What war is Abraham Lincoln referring to? Civil War. United States Civil War. Very good. Sumter, he's talking about Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina, which was the where the Civil War began. Okay? <clears throat> Criticizing both the government's response and the American people's apathy over the attack, Roosevelt wrote that he was pretty well disgusted with our government and the way our people acquiesce in it and support it. Okay. So how they how they are involved or how they engage with the government. Okay. So, again, we do have a lot of people that are outraged at the sinking of the Lusitania. But two things can be true at one time. You can have a lot of people that are outraged, and you can have a lot of people that really don't care either way. And then that's kind of how this works. You can, it, can be, it can be both of those. The same way like the New York Yankees can be the most uh, loved baseball team in America and also be the most hated. Because a lot of people love them. But also, there's a lot of people that hate it. So, two things can be true at once. All right, so what I want you guys to do, I want you to read this excerpt. It's short. It's short. I want you to read this excerpt. I want you to answer the questions below. I have two questions from the introduction, which is why they're just bullet pointed. I guess three questions technically. Then I have four questions that are just based on that small excerpt right there. All you've got to do, read through it a little bit, answer the questions, submit. We'll go over these. Uh, I may just post like a quick video so we don't have to use class time. I might just post a quick video to. Uh, yeah, I might just post a quick video to classroom so you can kind of check over it. Uh, make sure you have the right information so we don't have to use class time doing it. And then again, I'll go back to it and create it as it. Okay? So you can easily knock this out by the end of class. You have 20 minutes left. Again, you ain't got much reading to do. We already read half of it together. Um, so go ahead and do this for me. What we'll do tomorrow, um, depending on the weather, I don't know. Uh, if we are, for some reason, just virtual tomorrow, you can still expect to be talking about some of our battles, okay? Class will still function somewhat normally tomorrow. I may not have, like, a video session. I may just kind of give you the information and let you do it yourself, okay? We'll kind of see how that goes. I don't know what we're going to be told, um, you know, if... There is inclement weather. Okay, so that's all I've got for you today. If there are any questions, you are free to ask. You are free to. Um, well, yeah. If there's any questions, let me know. Let me know. But I do want you to go ahead and work on this. For those of you that are virtual, um, again, I do want you to work on this. This is due tomorrow. If you can go ahead and knock that out now, that might be very good for you. I'll make it a whole lot easier. Um, but 
At this point, you are good to go. All right. Oh, dude.